So Jessica Nordell um, is joining us now. Hey, Jessica. Hi. Uh, I'll just give a brief introduction. Jessica is a science and culture journalist whose writing has appeared in The Atlantic, The New York Times, The New Republic, and many other publications. A former writer for public radio and producer for American Public Radio, she graduated from Harvard University and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She lives in Minneapolis, Minnesota. The End of Bias, The Beginning is her first book. And The End of Bias, The Beginning is a fascinating and illuminating exploration of the universal phenomenon of bias and how it can be both better understood and overcome. The book takes us through corporate boardrooms and workplaces, PhD programs, and pre-K settings. It traces the historical roots of modern bias and delves into research on the frontier of dismantling the norms, stereotypes, and associations that maintain harmful biases today. While, while it analyzes a dark subject matter, focusing on oppression, cruelty, and exclusion, the book is ultimately hopeful and inspiring. You leave the book excited to embark on your own personal journey of freeing yourself from harmful bias and also helping others. I really enjoyed this book. I thought it was brilliantly written. You're a great journalist and uh, you're also an amazing writer. Um, is there anything you wanna say before we get started in the question section? Thank you for that awesome introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, no, I mean, I'm just really thrilled to be here. I, this is my first book and so um, I'm discovering what it's like to put something out into the world. And I have to say that having a conversation with a book club is like by far my favorite way of like talking about the book and interacting. So I'm just really excited to be here. Have you been uh, looking at Goodreads and like seeing what they're saying there? Yeah, yeah. I'm sure that's like its own weird experience. Yeah, I mean, fortunately, the yeah, people have been pretty enthusiastic and have had mm -hmm. kind of responses like yours on Goodreads. But yeah, no, it's it's exciting to see yeah. how it lands for people. Everyone has their own, you know, experience of the book. For sure. Yeah. And the book covers a lot of ground. There's a lot of things we can discuss today. Hopefully we can touch on a lot of the subjects that are in the book. But I just wanted to get started on um, kind of like a bigger picture question. Um, I know that your book focuses primarily on examples of contemporary bias, whether it's in the workplace, in college settings, in uh, police forces, uh, and elsewhere. And that's largely because uh, today we have more case studies on bias that are peer reviewed, and you can only interview people who are alive today, of course. Uh, but you're very careful in the book to connect it to the larger framework of history. Um, can you talk about how you approached weaving history into this book? Absolutely. You know, as I was beginning the process, I was really, as you mentioned, you know, I was really focused on research that shows, that demonstrates the presence of bias today, and then research that shows how we combat it. But throughout that research process, the questions kept sort of presenting themselves to me, um, questions like, well, where does this actually come from? I mean, who 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 started these problems? I you know we I know that they're culturally specific and culturally contingent, but I really wanted to understand um, what the origin of these biases were. So that's what really took me to the study of history, and you know I'm I'm kind of driven by curiosity more than anything. So I just really wanted to understand like where, how did patriarchy start? Who, who was the first you know person to introduce the idea that um, there's a hierarchy of the sexes and that men are above women so it you know so so that was one of the areas of history that I was really interested in looking at and I ended up um, talking to Assyriologists and Egyptologists and specialists in Mesopotamia to try to understand um, more about the origins and discovered that you know patriarchy is so old you know what it's getting kind of dark let me see if i can open the open this maybe that helps a little bit um that it's so old that in some parts of the world you actually have to look at burial records to see places where um women and men were buried in similar ways so we we understand that they were seen more equally in society because the patriarchy is so old that it like predates the written record in many parts of the world. And similarly, I, I really wanted to understand race. Where did the idea of race come from? You know, we know that it's, uh, that it's a creation. It's, it's not, there's nothing real that distinguishes people among 
that, you know, that allows people to be grouped in into races. So there too, I had this question, where did it come from? You know, how, how did the races get um, uh, sort of created by humans, which, which took me down like a long, a long road of looking at the history there too. Um, so it was really, really a question. It was really motivated by trying to understand where these contemporary cultural biases come from that took me really deeply into history. That exploration of history in your book gives it much more authority uh, because if you just talk about contemporary examples of bias, as you said, it's like these things didn't happen in a vacuum. There's there's deep histories, there's powerful interests that are maintaining these biases and we do have to look at the roots. Um, this book is exploring what it means to be a human being, like fundamentally, like how we're conditioned in societies and how we interact with others. And so there's no way to avoid looking at yourself and looking at how you yourself experience bias and how you yourself uh, have been conditioned. So I'm wondering, um, you talk a lot about how you incorporated elements of mindfulness and just like self-reflection while working on this book. Um, what are some of the ways that you transformed and that you were freed by working on this book? You know, I really came out of this book. I would say I came out of this book like a kind of a different person than I was when I went into it. I think it's Robert Frost who said that if there's no change for the writer, there's no change for the reader. And I, I felt really deeply changed. I mean, I think I went into the process thinking, well, I'm just a little bit less biased than everybody else, probably, you know, <laughs> and then um, came really had to come face to face with my own internal uh, my own, my own biases, my own internalized sexism and misogyny, you know, ways that I had turned, uh, gender bias against myself and against other women. Um, I had to look at ways that racial bias had, you know, seeped into my own consciousness and that I, the ways that I'd inherited that like toxic legacy as well, and how it affected how I interacted with the world and the kind of assumptions and stereotypes that I projected onto others. So, um, it was a very humbling experience, really seeing not just, you know, the um, this phenomenon as it, ex you know, was expressed in, in studies and in the world, but really like how it expressed in myself and from myself toward other people too. And I think, you know, how did I change? I mean, I think that um, I became, because I became much more aware of how these biases were working in my own mind, um, I became much more attuned to how they were shaping interactions and I became more, um, more likely to pause, I, more practiced, I guess maybe would be the way of putting it. I more practiced at pausing, noticing the kinds of assumptions that I was bringing to a situation or a person, and then using that pause to decide, okay, do I actually want these assumptions to be what I'm, you know, using what I'm basing my interaction on, or do I want to try something else? Do I want to use something else? Do I want to withhold those assumptions and just kind of like let the situation unfold or let the let this interaction express itself in in whatever way it's going to? So I think I just became a lot more careful about that and a lot more um, practiced at it, and um, and I think a lot more willing to go into situations of discomfort or uncertainty. Um, I became less afraid of uh, what would happen if I accidentally said the wrong thing or did the wrong thing and sort of came to a an understanding that um, it's possible to repair relationships, it's possible to move forward. And really the only way any of us can move through our biases is through relationships with other people and working through them in the context of relationships. So those are some of the ways that I changed. Uh, and you write about heuristics um, in the book, mental shortcuts that we have when we encounter different situations and contexts. Um, I'm curious, like, since heuristics are neutral inherently, but a lot of us have uh, heuristics, mental shortcuts that end up stereotyping or end up being surrounded by harmful biases, did you find like your heuristics changing, like your mental shortcuts, like becoming more enlightened, so to speak? That's an interesting question. Um, I don't, but that's an interesting question. I don't know if my heuristics changed, 
but I think they they had less power over me. I think in general, I think my biases, while those this, the associations are still there in my mind because I you know we inherit so much from our culture, they just have less power over me. Like I can observe them sort of as an object, like as a as a third party in a way. Oh, I see such and such happening in my mind. Huh, that's interesting. Like I'll put it aside and continue on according to how I actually want to be, you know, engaging in this encounter. Intentional with everything. Much more intentional, yeah. Yeah. And you were very intentional about how you approached this book, which I found really impressive. At one point when you were struggling to find studies on um, the effect of cumulative bias towards women in the workplace, you built your own uh, computer simulation, NormCorp, with the help of some uh, computer programmers. Um, I know that you went to MIT and you took STEM classes. Had you had any experience building virtual worlds before? And is this something that you want to do again to look at other forms of bias? Yeah, you know, that um, that experience was was fascinating because I'd never worked really on a collaborative computer science project before. I hadn't I hadn't built an agent based model before. I'd read about them. I thought they sounded really interesting. And then when I found this gap in the research about the longitudinal effect of bias as it accumulates over time, um, I thought, well, this would be a great opportunity to try something. And, you know, I mentioned it to a couple of people and they were like, that's a crazy idea. Like why, you know, how's that ever going to work? But um, fortunately I was able to find some computer science. Well, I found one computer science professor who then directed me to another computer science professor. And finally, you know, found someone who was really excited about it. And um, we ended up having an amazing collaboration. I, I loved the experience. I mean, partially just because writing is so solitary and so monk-like that actually just having someone else to be working on a project with was like really uh, invigorating and exciting. And also I think that we we found some really interesting conclusions. You know, the the one of the cool things about an agent-based model is that it allows you to Take, make a bunch of assumptions, take a bunch of assumptions, and then just kind of see what happens and how, what sort of unexpected outcomes emerge over time. And I, I do think it would be interesting to, um, to, do, to use the same, I mean, we've talked about this, to use the same method to look at other kinds of long-term cumulative bias, like, for instance, in healthcare um, or in, you know, in medicine, looking at the, the accumulation of the stressors of racism, for instance, and how that affects people's health over the long term. We have a term for it, which is weathering, um, which refers to <clears throat> the cumulative health effects of, of racism. But that's something that's also, it hasn't fully been quantified in a long term um, sense. So I think that would be another really cool application of the, the computer simulation. For sure. Um, I found it really uh, just satisfying how you built this uh, simulation and it seemed to be a direct repudiation of Antonin Scalia's ruling uh, against the Walmart workers earlier in the book that he described where he's literally describing the structure of patriarchy then he says like oh clearly nobody would be this intentional right but it's like it this is what cumulative effects do yes yes yeah I mean I remember yeah the quote was what was the quote it was like um, there's no way that these sorts of disparities could be achieved unless there was an intentional effort on the on the part of managers to to be prejudiced. Yeah, so we found that that was totally not true. Yeah. <laughs> it's like this is the society we live in. It's there's problems here, and we should address them. Um, I mean, Scalia also said that managers would never do anything uh, except choose people on the basis of. Um, you know, merit and, and like, qualification, yeah. <laughs> which I not think so as I said in the book, that. I was like, has he ever had a job? Like, yeah, that's for real. Um, just going to shift gears a little bit. Uh, large sections of the book focus on uh, the bias of police, um, and you dramatize how Euronimo Yanez killed Philando Castile to demonstrate a lethal lethal combination of fear, violent power stress and extreme bias and you look at how the los angeles police department which is notorious today for its abuses forged a better relationship through one of his programs with three public housing buildings in the Wasp neighborhood of la 
I'm wondering what drew you to this area of research and uh, why did you focus on it knowing that uh, so many people in the U.S. believe that it's an unreformable institution that's rooted in slave patrols? Mm -hmm. Yeah, first of all, well, I guess I would say uh, it it is rooted in, it, it's not necessarily that we believe that it's rooted in slave patrols. It actually, I mean, the first publicly funded policing organization in the South was the slave patrol. Uh, so it, and, and, you know, as I, I was reading, as I was doing the research, I read, I came across a really incredible book by Sally Haddon called Slave Patrols, which is an entire history of, of the, uh, the, the institution in the South. And, um, you know, when you read the, the, uh, the kind of activities that the slave patrol was tasked with, and then read about LAPD, you know, the echoes are alarming. Um, so the reason that I that I wanted to focus on policing was that it is uh, in many ways one of the most consequential, if not the most consequential um, institutions in which bias has, has an effect. And uh, maybe healthcare would be, you know, a close second, but what really drove my research about policing was a question about whether biased policing can be changed, whether there are any approaches that actually have been found to change people's behavior, to behave in a more respecting, just, equitable way toward communities. And you know, I, I I came in with the same skepticism. Like, is this something that can be changed, or or is the institution fundamentally, you know, un unfixable? So, I I found you know what I included in the book were approaches that have some data behind them um, that are that show some promising results. Like in Watts, for instance, when uh, this small program actually completely flipped the incentives that police were given from your goal is to make arrests to your goal is to build relationships. And that's what you're going to be evaluated on the basis of. That's how you're going to be promoted. That's how you're going to be seen as successful in this organization. Changing the incentives actually did in a, in a, quantitative way change the behavior of the police, which I found really interesting. I mean, what happened was in Watts, for instance, when police were um, given these new incentives and told your goal is to build relationships, they decreased the amount of the number of arrests that they made. They increased the level of trust that they had with the community. And when it was evaluated by independent researchers, the program was evaluated over ten, after 10 years, it was evaluated by independent researchers. Um, they found that not only had arrests gone down, but violent crime had also gone down. And one potential mechanism for that is that with increased legitimacy, when the police are seen as more legitimate because they're treating people with dignity and respect, then the law is also seen as more legitimate. And people are more likely to engage in law abiding behavior if they see the law as more legitimate. So. This, I think, is a really promising, small, you know, small and limited, but promising sign that there are ways if you go beneath, you know, beneath policy to actually like incentives, that there are ways to potentially change how police are interacting um, to create just safer communities for everybody. Not just the communities that are benefiting, it's also the police themselves who are benefiting, which you do a really good job illuminating. Um, you describe how generally in the warrior culture of policing, police have extreme PTSD, depression, anxiety, they're very guarded and very hardened, um, and that leads to sleeplessness, it leads to high rates of alcoholism, divorce, suicide, all sorts of terrible outcomes. And you, you describe police officers who start incorporating mindfulness and suddenly they feel kind of freed from those uh, burdens. Uh, they feel more connected to other people, more excited about doing their job. I think maybe the most beautiful example you describe is the police officer who goes to a home um, for a domestic violence dispute. And rather than arresting 
the man who was yelling at his wife. Um, he she sits with him and hugs him, and uh, that diffuses the entire situation. So rather than creating a cycle of incarceration and violence, she was able to diffuse the situation through mindfulness and through just like caring about our community member. And I thought that was really profound. And if we saw that replicated on a large scale, uh, I think it would it would change a lot in our country. I completely agree. I was really moved by that story as well. And in fact, the man said to her later, you know, you saved my life. You treated me as a human being. And um, so, I mean, I got to know a lot of police officers over the course of researching and writing this book. And the ones who had incorporated mindfulness into their practice said it completely changed how they interacted with the community. I mean, one, um, I, I think he, uh, Sergeant Scott Vincent said, you know, I used to just see people almost as objects. You get really hardened. Like you, as you were saying, you know, the, the job makes you really hardened. And he said, you know, I would see people and just say like, you're a doper, you're an asshole, you're this, you're that. And the, seeing people as objects completely affected how he interacted with people. And then once he started developing this practice of mindfulness, he just stopped seeing people as objects and it, it changed him. Um, and yeah, I mean, as you say, like it's better for the police as well. They're, they're more calm. They have less aggression, fewer health problems. Um, the question is whether they're willing to try it. And that was something that, you know, as you yeah. read in the book, like not all police are open to it. Some are pretty resistant and pretty defensive. For sure. Um, that's going to get to, I think, another question I have later on. But for now, um, <clears throat> racism doesn't just plague the institution of policing. It pervades all aspects of American society and global society. Um, and in the U.S. right now, there's a lot of debates around critical race theory. has become a boogeyman for a lot of parents uh, who don't want CRT taught to their children, even though most of them have no idea what CRT is. Um, I think this gets to... Um, like a larger problem in the U.S. schooling. Uh, U.S. schooling seems to be structured around a highly punitive and controlled approach where gender norms are very rigid and information is whitewashed. And it runs in direct opposition to what you found at the school uh, called Agalia in Sweden, where children are given the space and freedom to emerge into their unique selves. Um, you write about in the book how children are like clay because they absorb the values of community and its ways of being and also about how you realize the awesome power that adults have when engaging with children. Um, after going to Agalia and working on this book, how do you now think of your own education in the US and what do we risk by failing to apply the principles found at Agalia? That's so interesting. You know, I, I went to Agalia thinking that, um, thinking that I was really looking into uh, sexism and how uh, how adults could decrease the gender norms that they applied to children and um, that constrict children's ability to be themselves. But I think what I concluded actually was that what Egalia fights even more than than sexism and racism is actually ageism. Um, it's a school that that takes children so seriously as important beings, as valuable, <laughs> and as as um, beings that have the right to determine their own future and their that have the right to make choices about not only you know what gender identity they want to express or what sort of you know activities or hobbies they want to participate in, but like who they are in the world and um, what they want their future to be like. And I found that so deeply respectful, you know, so um, it, it was just, it, it made me see how sort of disrespectful I think we are to children in this culture by the um, complete focus on like extrinsic motivation in our schools. I mean, we, we train children from such a young age to respond to rewards that come from outside instead of like developing their own sense of 
what's right or their own sense of who, who they are, who they want to be. And I think what we lose from doing that to your question is um, generations of people who know who they are and what they want and like where they fit in the world. You know, I, I would say, you know, my education was, was very, very um, influenced by like external rewards and extrinsic motivation. And that that's, I think it's extremely harmful. In a, you know, in addition, um, there's, yeah, absolutely like gender norms that, you know, come into play that affect children and their, their belief about who, what they can do and who they are and who they should play with and um, what the kind of limits of their self-expression can be, um, which is also really harmful. But I think, I don't know, I was kind of surprised to, to, to conclude that, that the umbrella for all of the gender freedom and all these other kinds of freedoms that the children were given was really um, an absence of ageism, like an absence of the belief that because children are young, they're like less valuable and they're less uh, important. And I think if we could shift to an attitude of deep respect for children, no matter what age they are, um, we would we we would be much better off. We'd have a healthier adults too. I agree. Um, and you talk about your own reflections on that issue in the book, and you say how um, there were times in your life where you laughed at something a child said because it was unintentionally funny to to someone as an adult from your perspective and how as from the child's perspective it was probably very confusing to hear someone laugh at something when they were being earnest and there's just so many examples of that when children are, are be, interacting with adults just being minimized mocked uh just like neglected in various ways um and i think agalia is in the the process of norm changing you, you write about in the book how norms determine the limits of behavior. And I'm wondering if there are some positive norms that you think are emerging today. Hmm. I think so. I mean, I think that um, we're seeing in the US at least um, mm -hmm. more of an understanding of gender as a spectrum as opposed to a binary. I think that's, mm -hmm. that's really good. That's a really positive sign, particularly, uh, you know, keeping in mind the fact that the idea of like two genders is just a, a very cultural, culturally mm -hmm. specific construction. There are lots of cultures throughout history and time that have had many more. Mm -hmm. um, the boogies of South Sulawesi had five genders. Historically, many indigenous cultures have had three genders. So um, I think that's a really positive, that's a really positive direction that we're moving in. I think, you know, the norm of um, kind of the white perspective being the the central kind of centered perspective seems to be shifting. I think that's a really mm -hmm. positive and important change that's happening. Um, yeah, those are a couple that come to mind that seem to be, you know, signs of hope, things to yeah. give us hope, hope, make us hopeful. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, so your book covers a lot of ground and it it's very deliberate about the science it, it uh, explores. So I'm, I'm assuming that uh, one of the major omissions that I saw in the book is due to the lack of scientific studies around it. But um, under the form of capitalism that's practiced globally, the profit motive often trumps human well-being and flourishing. And all you have to do is look at the problems of homelessness, hunger, and poverty to see this. And that is a profound form of bias because we have enough homes to house everyone. We have enough food to feed everyone and we have enough wealth to el eliminate poverty. The only thing that maintains uh, the existence of those problems is the bias that money and the ability to make money should trump human well-being, at least that's my opinion. Uh, what are your thoughts on this topic, the biases of the, the economic system, and would you explore it in a future book? Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when I was, when I was going about um, thinking about this book and planning it, I was really focused on kind of the phenomenon of bias, the phenomenon of unintentional or unconscious bias that has to do with assumptions that we make when we are interacting with another person, um, whether it's on the basis of that person's race or gender or age or religion. But the truth is that when we 
are influenced by stereotypes. Those stereotypes are often, they take place within a set of assumptions about who has value, whose life has value, whose opinions have value. Um, I mean, we see this in, just as a brief aside, one of the most alarming studies that I came across was in healthcare that really, I think, exemplified this idea of who has value, um, which was a study I write about in the book that looks at, it's actually a meta-analysis of studies that um, find that when patients have vascular disease, you see black patients and white patients controlling for things like disease severity and insurance status and hospital quality, you see black patients being more likely to experience the amputation of a limb than as opposed to a, a limb sparing treatment when you compare them to white patients, which I think speaks, you know, horrifically and seriously to um, assumptions about value, whose body has value, honestly. And when I think about your question about kind of economic bias, I think that the economic bias that's built into our society also has to do with assumptions about who has value. You know, we, we've, you know, as a society decided that, um, that people who have more money have more value. You know, we treat people with, with, with more, you know, as though they have more value in the society. And um, if people are, not able to be economically productive. You know, we don't, we see them as less valuable in the society. And um, I don't know if it's an unconscious thing, actually. I don't know if it's unconscious or un and unintentional or if it's, you know, sort of just baked into how we, how we think about people. So I would, I think I, I would be interested in exploring it in the future because I, I think there's that common thread of, um, assignation of value that is kind of underlying all forms of bias, really. So that that's, I think, what we need to really attack. That's that that's the, sort of the root of the problem is, um, you know, cultural beliefs about who who's important. Uh, one of the major uh, propagators of cultural belief our media institutions in our society. Um, they have a lot of power when it comes to shaping opinion and beliefs and norms. And uh, some media institutions seem to have a corrosive effect on society. Um, you write about in Rwanda, um, a radio station that had a very corrosive effect leading up to the genocide. Um, and there's many other contexts where uh, media programs and uh, stations we're influencing people in a very harmful way. Um, in the U.S. today, there's of course Fox News, which has had a very corrosive effect for the past few decades. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, of course, there's social media with its algorithms that seem to be further fanning these biases. And how do we recon uh, reconcile ideals of free speech with the greater well-being of society? That's a huge question. But I, know you thought about it. <laughs> I will solve it in ten seconds. Um... I mean, I think that we really have to understand that the media is not just a reflection of society, but it does create society. I think it's really disingenuous for media organizations to say, oh, we're, you know, we're just reporting. I really felt this strongly during the lead up to the 2016 election when media organizations would routinely show Trump at enormous rallies. Every time a television show showed Trump at an enormous rally, it bolstered a norm about him as a popular and desirable candidate. And when that was expressed over and over and over, it gave him a status and a power that he would not have had, frankly, if the media had not given him that kind of attention. So I think that we have to I think we have to really, I think media organizations have to really take seriously their role as a, as a propagator of norms. Um, and I'm not sure how, how we do that exactly. It probably starts with awareness. I mean, maybe I should write an op-ed about this. Um, or maybe a lot of people should write op-eds about this because I think that, um, 
Yeah, I, d I don't think that that is appreciated fully. I don't know if I've completely solved the problem. You're getting there. That's like halfway to the, to the solution. Um, but you write about in the book a lot how uh, institutions and structures don't occur out of thin air. They're made up of individuals and individuals play a significant role in maintaining them and adhering to them and in forwarding uh, their power in society. Um, this is a bit of a curveball question, but in uh, <laughs> uh, recent years, there's been growing research into uh, psychedelic therapy, which has been shown to increase neuroplasticity, making the mind more flexible, which can help people overcome harmful behaviors like smoking cigarettes or helping them deal with profound grief, like with people who have cancer. And research has also shown that these interventions can make people more loving, open-minded, and more connected to one another. Uh, is this an area that you studied while working on the book? And if so, what did you find? If not, is this something that you would like to look at in the future as it concerns bias? That is really fascinating. I will tell you that um, I didn't look at psychedelics in particular, but I would say the closest that I came was the research about um, the fMRI studies that I looked at about what happens after people have experienced mindfulness meditation or compassion meditation over a long period of time. So I think this is the maybe the closest to what you're talking about. There, there are some really interesting studies that show that over a period of time, if someone engages regularly in loving kindness meditation, which involves repeating the repeating sort of mantras, may you be well, may you be happy, may you be free from harm to ever increasing circles of people, the self, a friend, someone you don't like, um, someone you don't know, the whole world. Once you do that over a long period of time, there are studies that show that the brain responds differently than someone who hasn't done that when they're faced with a picture of the self and a picture of the other. And what the studies show is that after loving kindness meditation over a period of time, um, the brain responds more similarly to pictures of self and other than it does if you haven't done the loving kindness meditation, which is so interesting and provocative. And it suggests that like, we can actually start to break down or dissolve a little bit that boundary between self and other that creates so much harm in the world. Like if I see you and me as actually not these separate entities, but actually deeply connected and not that separate from one another, I mean, that, that would change everything, I think, about how we would interact with one another. So I'd love to see what psychedelics can do. <laughs> I, have, I haven't seen any studies about how they affect bias, but I wouldn't be surprised at all if you would see something similar. Um, this is my final question before we go to the audience. But um, as someone who's struggled with depression and, and anxiety throughout my life, I know firsthand that there are many stigmas surrounding mental health. I also know that mental health issues are widespread in the US. They're very likely underreported and people often struggle to speak out out of fear. Um, at the same time, many biases seem to have a significant mental health component, such as the police officers who pro you profile with extreme PTSD that seems to prevent them from engaging with these mindfulness uh, programs that they're uh, invited to participate in. Uh, I'm wondering, can we even begin to dismantle harmful biases when there's stigmas surrounding the treatment of mental health? That is really interesting. And in fact, um, my next book is going to be about mental health. Um, I, I I find this topic completely fascinating. We could do a whole hour just about mental health. I mean, one of the things that I find really interesting about mental health research um, and stigma, sp specifically stigma around mental health, is that the direction that research is going um, with regard to mental health is actually going in the opposite direction of reducing stigma. And I I, met, I described this really briefly in the book, and I wish I could have spent more time on it. But, but essentially, um, one of the things that drives stereotyping is essentializing, which is 
believing that there's something essential about this person or this group of people I'm interacting with that makes them different from me and that makes them all the same as one another. Mental health research over the last decades has really gone in the direction of the biophysiological um, explanation for mental health problems. So um, the idea that there is a, something biologically different about a group of people that has X mental health condition um, as compared to a group of people that doesn't have it. The problem is that the more we see mental health as being this biological um, this biological phenomenon, the more we essentialize people who have who, who suffer from mental health problems because um, they're they're seen as as somehow biologically different, you know, fundamentally different. And there is research that shows that the more we see them, we see mental health as a or mental illness or mental health challenges as biological, the more um, the more stigma is actually attaches to them. So, I mean, I think one thing that we need to do is to is to start normalizing more of the social and environmental determinants of mental health and the contextual determinants and the you know the sort of broader determinants. Um, so that we understand that we're all, we are, we are all mental health beings that are all struggling in various ways and, um, and that there isn't this sort of like strong divide between people who suffer and people who don't suffer. I think that would help a lot in decreasing stigma and ultimately leading to more healing. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it would be very reductive if it solely focused on the biological aspects of it because as we're discussing, we're t we live in a society that's so biased that uh, enacts so much harm on almost every individual. Uh, so by the time a lot of people get to the point where they can acknowledge and address their ment mental health issues, it's because of the social processes that they went through. Um, so I, I think we're going to bring Nikki back on, who's going to open this up to if we have any audience questions. And I'm back. Sorry. Um, thank you so much uh, for that great discussion. Um, so now it's time to open up the questions to our audience. If you have any questions, submit a question by clicking the little question mark button, and we'll be able to pull you up to the audience and ask a question. Uh, please make sure to say your name, uh, where you're from, and then you can ask your question. Please ask a question. <laughs> oh, good. I wonder if there's an internet connection challenge. Hi there. Hi. Can you hear me? Um, thank you so much, Jessica. Uh, my name is, is Deb Lewis and Grant. Um, I'm calling in from uh, New York as the director of employee engagement and experience. And um, I, I wish I had read the book before this conversation, but I am certainly going to read it now. Um, it sounds like a fascinating topic and one that deserves um, a lot more attention and focus. Uh, so I wanted to just uh, go back to the comments you were making about um, how in society uh, that there tends to be this perspective that, that children are less valued or that their opinions or their perspectives are not, are not valued. Um, it's funny because I feel like I have a slightly different perspective on that question because it feels like as a parent, um, and as a parent observing other parents, that there is a tremendous um, push to uh, hold or value or support children's perspectives and, and needs and interests. But that what ends up happening is that when you, you know, set them loose from the home and they go into the, into the world and particularly into school, that seems to be largely organized on the basis of grouping, sorting, 
uh, creating hierarchies, um, that whatever uh, opportunities or lessons you tried to instill in the home in terms of I, I really value your voice, I value your opinion, you should express yourself as you'd like, it becomes really difficult to do that once you go into a school setting. And so my question is, I, I, I'm wondering, like, how do we address this issue of bias in schools when we already can't even agree as to the value of critical race theory um, as, as we have to acknowledge the fact that schools are essentially dealing with you know, huge amounts of children coming into these settings where they're largely understaffed and um, teachers don't really have experience about dealing with bias. Like how do we start addressing these questions to make schools more sensitive to this issue and see schooling as a, a, a unique opportunity to, to start creating awareness about bias, um, but doing it in a way that is less divisive um, in the social political theater we currently find ourselves in. Hmm. Oh, that is a, it's a difficult question. I mean, one thing that, you know, one thing that sort of um, I concluded after, after doing the research for this book is that there are many, there are many kinds of interventions that we can bring in. Um, there are, uh, there are ways to um, eliminate um, bias in, um, which children get assigned to which sorts of, which sort of program. Um, there are ways to, there are, so there are sort of a variety of like technical interventions or technological interventions to reduce bias. Um, but ultimately, you know, it comes down to leaders' motivations. And I mean, I'm just thinking about research about the workplace. You know, there are lots of ways to create more biased, more fair workplaces, but ultimately it comes down to whether the leaders, the people who are actually have the power and are making the decisions, um, actually believe that it's valuable and believe that it's important to the, the fundamental workings of the business. And I, I imagine something similar is true in education. So um, how do you change leaders' mindsets? I mean, uh, there is some research that some trainings can be effective. I mean, one of the chapters in my book goes through which trainings work, what elements they have, how they can um, uh, how they can be used most effectively. There are, there's also in, in the education field, there's some really interesting research about um, ways to reduce bias in teachers, not through anti-bias trainings in particular, but through empathy building trainings. So instead of actually working on teachers and administrators' biases, you instead focus on building empathy through things like training teachers to look for situational reasons for a student's behavior, um, avoid labeling, um, uh, understanding like the importance of building relationships to student success. So there's, yeah, there's like one case study that I talk about that actually it ha it halved, halved, H-A-L-V-E-D, halved the suspensions of black and Latino students um, as a, as a consequence of this training. And it wasn't an anti-bias training, it was really an empathy building training. So, you know, the trick there is that when trainings are mandatory, that can create backlash. So it's important sometimes for these trainings to be voluntary. So it gets a little bit complicated, but I mean, I think we can, we can move in that direction if we use approaches that have data behind them, which is really what I tried to do in this book. I really tried to find approaches that had the best sort of quantitative, um, you know, qu quantitative, uh, justification or um, findings behind them. Um, so I don't, I don't have like a, an, an, in an, an instant answer to your question, but I think there are a few different things that, that can be tried that are, that are effective. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, hi. Hi, I'm Mariana, and my question is, is there anything you edited out of the book that you can share with us? We will not tell anyone, I swear. <laughs> anything I edited out of the book? You know, um, there there was one section that I um, was planning to write, and mm -hmm. I, I ended up not including it um, honestly just because of time and the and length. 
And now I kind of wish that I had because it's a question that comes up a lot, which is um, about confronting in real time um, a situation where someone is expressing bias. Like, what do you do as a bystander? Okay, yeah. Yeah. And I what had, <laughs> well, um, so, so one thing that's really important is to keep in mind three uh, kind of basic human needs that everyone has. And if you keep those human needs in mind in your interaction, it makes the confrontation go a lot better. So those are the human need for autonomy, autonomy. the human need for competence, mm -hmm. and the human need for relatedness. So if you can engage with someone and respect their need to have autonomy, to be able to feel like they, they have the freedom to do what they want, to feel competent, like they have the capacity to do the right thing and to be re in relationship with you um, rather than using guilt or shame or kind of pushing someone away, but actually kind of bringing them into relationship. Those, um, if you, you if you sort of keep that, that framework in mind when interacting with someone, um, it, it tends to be more effective yeah. and to go a lot better. Oh, and then one question to piggyback on that. What are your thoughts on the 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene? Is that kind of like help or hurt bias? And I don't know the 48 Laws of Power. Can you tell okay. me? I've Can been you... seeing this all on TikTok. Um, it's like this, um, well, it's his book, Robert Greene. He basically kind of writes like uh, little hacks and like how to kind of not manipulate people, but kind of like kind of see their point of view like make them feel important like basically if you want to level up in your career like don't be better than your boss make them feel important but also do this it's kind of like people are saying it's manipulative but other people are like no you're just kind of learning how to navigate hmm. this, that kind of water so i haven't got to read it yet but i wanted to um read that next to your book as well so i was just want to see if you checked it out or anything interesting yeah no i'm i'm not familiar i mean i think it I would have to read it to really answer your question. It's, it's but... an older book from 98. So it's been out for a while, but uh, it's just kind oh. of resurging again on the internet. So oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, I'm going to check it out. But yeah. Yeah. Check it out if you need, if you have time. Yeah. Thanks for the recommendation. Of course. That's all from me. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Are there any other questions that we have? Anything you're dying to know? <laughs> I'm thinking about that technique that um, Federico Ardila uses in his classroom where he says, he asks for three hands to go up oh, yeah. before he <laughs> chooses anyone. <laughs> I like that. What a great guy. What a great teacher. Yeah. Um, Okay, I guess we'll bring Nikki back up if she's still here. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. This was such a great discussion. Um, thank you for reading along last month and bias with us on our Facebook group. Um, we will have updates on the next book selection soon. So uh, please keep updated on our Facebook group and we'll update you if there's any um, new news. And thank you so much for joining. Uh, thank you, Jessica. This was great. If you have any last words, feel free to <laughs> say any like closing. Oh, no, I would just say thank you, Joe, for the great questions. Really interesting um, to think about. And for anyone who has not read the book yet, but wants to continue the conversation, feel free to reach out to me. Um, my website has a contact form and I, I really love engaging with people about their reactions and thoughts and questions. So feel free to get in touch. And um, yeah, I'm just, I'm really grateful for the chance to talk with all of you. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye.